where you scream to watch that watch this and I'll dive down through this hairy reflection. Hi and welcome to watch this. I'm CJ Johnson. Thanks for joining me. Everyone loves a good music documentary or most people do. I certainly do. They come in a few camps. A lot of them are documentaries about bands that you already love. You're hanging out with people you know and love. Sometimes a music doco is revelatory to you. That's the case for me with Descent into the Maelstrom, the Radio Birdman story. The loudest band in the land, the energetic and frenetic Radio Birdman. Yeah, ha. Go! No one could play harder. There's no one as vigorous and violent and dangerous as Radio Birdman. You can go, yeah, right on. If we could still clear the room of our fans, we're doing something right. We were recruiting rock and roll soldiers. They were starting up a new race. Striding out as if to battle. We're gonna kill them. I guess I'm just a little too young to have captured the Radio Birdman wave, but Jonathan Sequeira has made a feature-length documentary about them, and he's joined me on Watch This. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, CJ. So, thank you for making this documentary, because now I know about Radio Birdman, and I'm very glad to know about Radio Birdman, and I can tell that if I'd been of age, if I'd been able to go see them live, I would have. Their, their live shows look amazing but just for people who don't know them just a little bit about them just to, to get us in the mood um well first up the whole point of the film really was to reach people who don't know about the band so that's good really glad about yeah. that uh it's really easy to just sell to the fans are not interested in that so much but radio birdman a band that formed in 1974 till 1978 was the original lineup run uh really a bunch of six outsiders in sydney at that time when really a time of change in australian culture anyway and all quite intelligent, quite intense people. And Dennis Tech, the main songwriter, moved to Australia from Ann Arbor, Michigan, just outside Detroit. So really brought a lot of that fabulous Detroit music from Motown right through to bands like the MC5 and the Stooges with him as well. But all the guys are into music in a big way. So really interesting time and a place, a bit of a scene, a bit of a movement really seemed to happen around the band. So in that way, it's a bit of a cultural history of of Sydney and Australia at that time. And would you say punk? No, they, they dislike the term punk. Do um, they? Yeah, there's, there's a band competition they played in called the Punk Band Thriller and, and Dennis said there, are no, there were no punks in Sydney at that time in 1976 when that went on. So they were sort of really just rock and roll. I mean, yeah. the Rolling Stones was Dennis Tech's biggest influence. He said that many times. and. And the other guys in the band, Rob Younger, the lead singer, and Warwick Gilbert were big collectors of Australian music and bands like the Easy Beats and Masters Apprentices. So more that 60s rock and roll, mm. 60s garage sound. Yeah. So what's interesting about their sort of explosion in Sydney is that it was such a localised explosion. It felt to me, from your film at least, like they were momentarily kings of Sydney, but not really outside of it. It was a very localised phenomenon. Yeah, for... For the first part of the career, definitely, and sort of for the last year or so, once they got a record out and people interstate could buy the record through mail order, they did it all themselves. Uh, then they really did start to reach other places and you had people like, say, Brad Shepard of the Hoodoo Gurus living in Queensland, mail ordering an EP and joining the fan club. Uh, and, and they did go to Melbourne a couple of times and that went well and Adelaide a couple of times as well and those Adelaide concerts in particular in particular a legendary so yeah that's a fantastic element of the film is seeing all the stuff that used to go into running an independent <laughs> band without all the tech we have today so the fan clubs and the handwritten and mailed through the post elements of of running a fan base yeah really sort of two things one was a do-it-yourself attitude mm -hmm. so yeah we'll, we'll do our own posters we'll book our own gigs no one's making this happen. We don't have the big record label support. It wasn't Sherbert or a band like that. But th th those bands used to play five nights a week and had this big record industry behind them. It's totally cottage industry. Mm. So yeah, do it yourself, design your own posters, put them up yourself, uh, book everything yourself. And that's what created something really organic and really grassroots and really real, basically, because it's from the fans getting on board and a bit like the film, it's been the same, the reaction, the fans getting on board and making it, getting it out there. So how did you come to Radio Birdman? 
One of those bands that has sort of always existed if you're into rock and roll music and Australian music, always quoted by other bands, uh, always radios appear, their, their first albums always sort of been around mm -hmm. in that scene. So always knew the music. They reformed in 1997. I should know all these dates, but 97, I'm pretty sure, for the Big Day Out tour. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's a chance, that was a chance for people to see them who, who missed it the first time. But there was a big, that whole early 80s Australian indie music scene really was on the back of Radio Birdman. All those bands will admit that. And, and so that's, that's how the music was there. It was just part of that legacy. So you always knew it if you're into that. It was really eclectic. It wasn't, bands were inspired by Radio Birdman that weren't just rock and roll bands. So uh, Julie Moston Gilbert, who's in the film, who saw them at the time, was her first proper gig. She'd only seen jazz bands before that. She formed a band, The Flaming Hands, and they were just so far removed. They were more keyboard sounding and everything. But she said, we saw them doing it. If those idiots could do it, we could do it too. That was the attitude that they created. And that was, yeah. That's how you got that whole scene coming out of them. There it is. That's the fun house, the Oxford Hotel, there was hookers. It was gays. It was everyone, because that, that was Taylor Square. It was, it was brilliant. You walk into up those stairs, and there's a sign above the door saying, one buck, no trendies. And once you're inside, you're in a club where you were completely safe. So you were working as an editor at the ABC and then decided to go become a documentary filmmaker? No, I, I, I left the ABC. This is your first feature. This yet. is my first feature, yep. yep. I'd, I'd been working since I left the ABC. Been working doing a lot of music video stuff for smaller bands and mm -hmm. directing them. Uh, yeah, doing yep. the whole lot, yep. shooting, directing, editing. Uh, basically, just interested in music stuff always because I've been doing music show at the ABC, uh, and really just doing bits and pieces stuff that I wanted to do after working for other people. It was about I just want to do the things that I like that I enjoy as much of that as possible. And then I thought I want to do something a bit bigger, and the opportunity came up. Uh, because I was doing a job for Radio Birdman's manager. Uh -huh. uh, I was uh, authoring, getting some archive together for them for the box uh -huh. set that they put out. I said, hey, anyone done a doco? He said, many have tried, but they've all failed or given up. He said, put something in writing, I'll present it to the band. And I did, and I really just followed through and persisted. So was it seeing the fact that there was a surprising amount of archive stuff that sort of made you feel that you could do it? Because uh, obviously you need that, and your film has yeah, plenty yeah, of yeah, it. Yeah. Well, I looked into what there was, but I was I was watching the archive that I was um, doing for them, mm. and it was I thought this is fantastic. You know, this band is amazing, and it's still this is forty years ago, mm. still the coolest band <laughs> it's in the 40 land. Forty years ago, yeah. And it's amazing. This stuff's mm. electrifying. So that was a big thing, and. Um, yeah, I, I knew, I kind of had a rough idea what was out there. So I thought, okay, there's enough mm -hmm. there to sustain it because you've got to have something. Then I realised there was all these photos from even really early on that people were so interested in this band and inspired that they were picking up a camera and taking photos. And mm -hmm. uh, that was a big thing. Oh, okay, there is enough there that, mm. that you, you know, at the very least there's a Ken Burns Civil War, you know, can just do with photos. Yeah. But yeah, there's so much people were really doing stuff. It was a real time of change and, and also, they were the focus. There's a lot of just still image paraphernalia, yeah, ticket stubs yeah. <laughs> and programs and posters galore that really give us a sense of the time and place. Yeah, yeah, that was really important and that stuff works more than just a photo yeah. for sure. There's two or three women who uh, you interview in the film, but I don't think you ever use the word groupie. Nah, <laughs> nah. <laughs> nah no. Someone said to me, ah, oh, there are no there were no drugs or groupies in it. I, I thought it'd be really boring, but wow, it was really interesting. I said, it's interesting because there are no drugs and no groupies in it. That was, that's, to me, not really. Yeah, well that really gets to the heart of something because so many music documentaries do have as their second act turning point, the drugs yeah. or the booze, and this one doesn't. And partly that's to do with who these individuals were because Two of them were medical students yeah. who went on to become doctors. Like this was an erudite, educated, urbane group of dudes. They yeah. weren't they weren't yobbos in any nah, way. That's they right. weren't yeah. they weren't uncouth. They were highly couth. <laughs> they're they're all thinkers, you yeah. know. Apart from the medical degree, like 
all of them were well read and all of them were really self-educated and really aware and, and interested in what was going on. So mm. really erudite, really thinkers is the best way I can put it. There's no mm. sort of class to that. It's just about how you engage with the world, what you think about it. And they were all like that. It was really different attitude. And that's what set them apart. And I think that's one of the big conflicts. You know, in Australia, you don't get rewarded for being smart. You get if you're a great cricketer, someone says, that's great. But if you're smart, they don't go, that's great. They want to put you down. They want to bring you down. It's not so much tall poppy. It's just, it's not respected in the same way. So I think being intellectual and being educated was was part of being an outsider, really. And that intelligence and educated thing combined with, you know, the lack of the second act turning point, it all went to hell because of heroin thing, means that I guess this is really a reason that they're not punk because I guess punk to a degree celebrated the fact that we can't really play but we can make music through our energy whereas they could play like it's over mm. and over again the film emphasizes the fact that they were perfectionists about playing <laughs> yeah they were obsessed with being good yeah yeah they set the, the bar as high as they could and they mm. just went for it that that was that was part of their personalities really to to be as good as they can and mm. and being okay is just not good enough and, and that compromise compromise with other um, parties and with the industry was not acceptable and compromise with themselves was not acceptable either. We always had a great time in Melbourne, but their music scene it was more about image and junkie chic. And that was something that Birdman just didn't tolerate. You know, we were more interested in the music, more interested in the performance, more interested in delivering to the audience. The interviews have a fun shape because Initially, you think one thing, and then perhaps you think like, hang on, they're all separate, they're all in separate places, and then by the end you realise something else. So obviously, the band required you to visit them all individually. Yeah, that, I mean, it's it was always the way it was going to be done. They're all over the world. Yeah. Ron Keeley, the drummer's in London, or just outside London, and Chris Mazowak, the guitarist, lives in the north of Spain. So... Uh, it was really just a matter of sort of going around and interviewing everybody. Uh, and really, you know, you pick up things as you interview and say, okay, this, I didn't know this and that's mentioned, so I'll take that up with the next person and you get a different point of view. But mm. early on, it was pretty clear there were different points of view <laughs> yeah. for everything in different memories, 40 years, yeah. people don't remember things the same way. It was always going to be chronological, so you know, yeah. oh, these are the things I need to ask about and tick off. Right. Someone's talking about that. Sometimes you ask the same question of a few different people because you might get different perspective, but you get the same and you'll just pick the person or the people who say it the best. And then other times you'll say, oh, such and such said, said this, I wasn't sure about that. Is that right? and they'll give you their take on it. Yeah. So it might bounce off each other. But you know, without knowing the exact structure, you know what the key points are that they, they sort of jump out at you. Even yeah. when you're interviewing, you go, oh, that'll be in there, that's that's interesting, what about that? Yeah. And which is the one who just laughs constantly? Oh, <laughs> Warwick, Warwick Gilbert. Warwick is player. hysterical. Yeah, he's, there he is on the base behind us, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because he, on the one hand, he says like, ah, oh, you know, I've suffered depression at various points in my life, but he laughs constantly. In fact, he never laughs most than when he's talking about depression. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's, that's the wonderful thing. Like, he tells you these serious things, but they're delivered with this humour. And yeah. people have said to me, wow, I was surprised how funny this film is. I didn't expect a documentary. Yeah to be funny and it is. I was laughing. We, we were sitting there doing the interview trying not to laugh because all this hilarious <laughs> stuff was coming out. Yeah. Yeah. At one point, the famous word demons gets used by someone else in relation to Dennis, but we haven't really seen throughout the film Dennis being either a monster or certainly not on drugs or booze or anything like that. So did you sort of decide to keep it Kind of. Um, it's sort of, I mean, the subtext, and it's probably something you might just pick up on a second viewing, to be honest. Okay. That, that it's just, he's driven. Dennis is driven. He's He wants things a certain way, and I think that's it. So it's it. a control it's not, thing they're really doing. Yeah, yeah, perhaps. Uh, I, I couldn't even quite put it into words, but he's a perfectionist. He wants the best. That's what part of what made the band great, but it's probably part of the story of what, split them apart a bit as well. I don't mean just in Dennis, I mean in all of them, that yeah. striving for a certain something is not easy. It's yeah. not easy, yeah. One of the band members says something towards the end that's very definitive and final. 
Ha, has that followed through or have they actually, has he gone back on that? Have you managed to get them all together for, for the screenings or anything? Uh, no, well, Chris and Ron are, are still overseas. They've seen it. Yeah. All the other guys have uh, um, saw it. We yeah. had a sort of cast and crew oh, yeah. media screening at the Chevelle, which went really well. Yeah. Uh, that was the first time they'd seen it. Right. And that was a bit scary. Oh, with an audience. With an audience, yeah, oh, yeah. I didn't. So they didn't insist you and you didn't offer two I, shows I was beforehand? was totally surprised but honoured that they totally trusted me and said, no, you do it. Good on you. And see how it goes. And they were great that way. They were amazing. So uh, that was a bit nerve-wracking, uh, sitting there watching that and thinking they're seeing it for the first time. But yeah. I've spoken to everyone since and they all love it. They're all really happy and, and they understand everyone gets their say. So even if there's conflict and... Absolutely. Dif different sides and, oh, I never knew such and such thought that. Oh, I never knew that. That's what they've said. They're, they're happy that they get their say as well. So right. that's the greatest praise for me, that they like it. There are a couple of sequences from just gigs and not even mega, mega, mega profile gigs where you've got different camera angles and excellent sound. How were you able to do that? Was that just unbelievably painstaking? Uh, the, the, are you talking the archive or the more recent stuff? I know the archive stuff. Oh, the archive There's stuff. The sound was recorded well. They, they, just, they just got recorded a, through the desk. They, no, they hired... A, 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 and ABC, actually, OB then, at the time to record at Paddington Town Hall, they hired that oh, okay. and recorded a whole live album. So a lot of the music in there is, is live music. Oh, okay. There's a great double album of live stuff. And I found that the live audio actually worked even better with the pictures, even if they're stills. Those photos come to life more and the sound comes to life more. So that was a great little yeah. uh, combination of chemistry between those two things. So, yeah. You've seen them perform live now, of course, but I mean, you must really, having gone through all of this, you must really wish that you could have seen them like yeah. in 1977 <laughs> at their oh. height at the Funhouse. <laughs> uh, strangely enough, I'm not nostalgic. Uh -huh. And one of the things was it's not about nostalgia, it was just important. Uh, rather, it's an important story. Um, yes and no, it's just, I don't think about it, it's something I wasn't there for. And I just actually just feel really privileged to sort of be part of the whole Radio Birdman thing to have my little role in sort of helping tell their story and just have been really made feel really welcome by all of them. Yeah. That's uh, that really feels great to me and and just to meet honestly the six most interesting people I've ever met in my life and and then again the people around them who are interviewed as well who are all fantastic amazing people and that's that's enough for me. That that's feels terrific great. to yeah. say. Yeah. yeah, and you're part of the the tribe. Yeah, now you got to wear you got to wear the colours. Yeah, so the interesting <laughs> that they came up with this logo that is so modern. By the way, it does not mm. look like something from the seventies. It looks mm. like something from right now. And how they use that to brand themselves. And there's an amazing moment in the film where you talk about like how you could be walking down the streets of Sydney with like a radio birdman, one of those on your jacket as a patch, and then you could see someone wearing it as a tattoo, and you'd go like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, was wearing this, I was wearing this shirt a couple of months ago down the street in Summerhill in Sydney, the inner west, and someone called out to me, someone I'd never seen before called out to me from across the street, so still got that power. But yeah, they were was, they was smart. They were thinking about how, how do we represent ourselves and yeah. in a way that, that gets across to people yeah. and people picked up on it. Yeah, so important. Jonathan Sequeira has made the feature length documentary Descent into the Maelstrom, the Radio Birdman story, and it begins screening around Australia on July 20th. And some of those screenings will include Q and A's with Jonathan and even perhaps members of the band. Uh, in Coffs Harbour, we've got Warwick Gilbert. He lives up in Coffs Harbour, so he'll be doing a Q and A up there. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming on Watch This. Thanks, CJ. Didn't look like everyone else and didn't act like everyone else. And everyone wanted to be like us. So if you can't do that, then you attack it, which is the great Australian way. The official rejection of our artistic stance was not unknown. We were treated like scum and outlaws, so we said, okay, well, that's just what we'll be then. <laughs>